Bora TV. The world is thinking. I'm always tempted when I see an audience like this to say, Sam Harris needs no, no introduction and then sit down. Uh, but um, you're such a weird group, I know that, <laughs> that uh, maybe I'll say something to try to find out why you're here. Of the, of the, three, uh, the three horsemen, or the, the great trinity of those people who have been called the new atheists, uh, we have had or tried to have all three of them here. Christopher Hitchens got sick and had to cancel. Uh, Richard Dawson was here, filled the place, and lectured for an hour about evolution in Berkeley. We had to go out and try to find somebody in Berkeley who didn't believe in evolution. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm expecting more from Sam Harris. Uh, Sam Harris's credentials are, are so numerous. He, after an experience with, uh, with ecstasy, he, he dropped out of college and decided to try to find the, uh, the way to wisdom and enlightenment in a more direct way. I went to India, meditated, learned a great deal about this tradition, came back, went to Stanford, and graduated. Uh, after that, he also took a degree in uh, in neuroscience, a PhD in neuroscience. He's written, uh, I believe this is four books, End of Faith, uh, Letters to a Christian Nation, and now the, the Moral Landscape, which is very appropriate for Berkeley because it's trying to see how science can determine and enlighten values and our senses of right and wrong, good and evil. I think it's... Uh, even gentle to say that Sam is a, a, a iconoclast, especially of religion. He has been very hard on all forms of fundamentalism, especially Islam, uh, and that gives that might give some of us in the in the progressive religious movement a uh, uh, make us feel more comfortable. But the fact is, he's pretty critical of progressive religion also seeing it as very often enabling of those with more radical beliefs. Uh, I always think of how when I read of him that how Paul Tillich said, um, you know, we always need atheists around. Believers need atheists. Sam is not an atheist, but he and Hitchens and, and, uh, and Richard are also, can be said, anti-theists. They are warriors in the battle against ideas of God uh, which are demeaning and which produce violence and ignorance. So it's nice to have him here. No, I don't think nice is the word. Uh, it will be illuminating to have him here. Sam. Thank you. Here. Thank you so much. Well, Sam, that is the, the first introduction that has uh, detailed my history of drug use. So I think it's, it's probably appropriate here in Berkeley. Uh, <clears throat> well, it, it's, it's an honor to be here. I've never spoken uh, in Berkeley before. And uh, as many of you know, I've been speaking uh, for, the next, for the last six years or so very critically about religion. And when you, when you criticize religion in public, what you immediately get are all the reasons why people think that's a terrible idea. Uh, and if, th the first reason is never that there's so much evidence that God exists, that you're denying the obvious, that you haven't read the Bible closely enough. The, f the first reason, even from fundamentalists, the, 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 the truth of religion is not the, the first line of defense. Uh, the first reason is that religion, it is imagined, offers the only possible framework to think about morality in, in, in truly global terms, in universal terms. Uh, and there, there are several things wrong with this claim. Obviously, it's not an argument. It's not, even if, even if it were true, it wouldn't prove that God exists. Re religion could function as a placebo. Uh, it also doesn't reconcile the obvious contradictions among the world's religions. It doesn't reconcile 
uh, the, the, the contradictory truth claims of Christianity and, and um, Judaism or Christianity and Islam. Uh, so it is kind of a non sequitur as a defense of God. But I used to think it was a totally empty claim. Uh, but now I've come to believe that actually religious people and, and even fundamentalists, perhaps especially fundamentalists, are, are worried about something that is worth worrying about. They're worried that secular people, for the most part, have become convinced that something has happened in the last 200 years of intellectual discourse that has made it impossible to speak about moral truth. Uh, and I continually meet people who seem to have had their, their convictions of moral truth eroded by something that has happened in science and philosophy. Uh, and this is, this is uh, I think, troublesome. I think we are in danger of waking up in a world where the only people who are sure that moral truths exist are religious demagogues who think the universe is 6,000 years old. Uh, and that's, that's not a world we should be eager to live in. So I, I'm going to push your intuitions around on this front. Uh, but just to give you a sense of the problem and uh, to tell you how this, this issue is really seared onto my brain, uh, I'll tell you a little story. I was at a conference a few years ago talking about the link between morality and human well-being, as I'm going to tonight. And I said something that I thought would be quite uncontroversial in this context. I said, listen, we know that morality relates to human well-being. We know that human well-being relates to the, 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 the facts that allow mind to emerge in the brain and and uh, so it's constrained by, by truth claims in some sense. And therefore we know that certain cultures are wrong about how to maximize human well-being. And therefore they are, uh, they're wrong in terms of what they value. And I cited as an example uh, life, under the t life for women, especially, under the Taliban. Uh, it seemed to me you know, their violent misogyny and religious lunacy was, was a pretty obvious context in which people, especially women, were not thriving. <clears throat> now, it turns out to denigrate the Taliban at a scientific conference is to court controversy. Uh, <clears throat> and so after I spoke, a, 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 another speaker came up to me and said, well, how could you ever say that the compulsory veiling of women is wrong from the point of view of science? And I said, well, Okay, the moment you link questions of right and wrong to questions of human well-being, then it seems pretty clear that forcing half the population to live in cloth bags and beating them or killing them when they try to get out is not a way of maximizing well-being and therefore not a good practice. And she said, well, that's just your opinion. <clears throat> I said, okay, well, let's just make it easier. Let's imagine we found a culture that was removing the eyeballs of every third child, okay, would you then agree that we had found a culture that was not perfectly maximizing human well-being? <clears throat> and she said, it would depend on why they were doing it. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so that after I picked my jaw back up off the floor, I said, <clears throat> okay, let's say they're doing it for religious reasons. Let's say they have a scripture which says every third should walk in darkness or some such nonsense. Okay. <laughs> and you'll be pleased or horrified to know that she just bit the bullet here and said, then you could never say that they were wrong. Okay. Now this is, uh, this was a woman who has a background in science and philosophy. She's now on the president's council for bioethics. She's one of 13 people advising our president on all of the issues related to progress in medicine and life science generally. Um, she had just delivered a totally lucid lecture on the moral implications as she saw them for, for the use of neuroscience in our courts. She was, she was very worried that we have been developing lie detection technology and that we are using this on captured terrorists. And she, she viewed this as an invasion of cognitive liberty. Okay, so on the one hand, her her, her moral scruples were really finely calibrated to our own possible missteps, in, in this case, in our war on terror. 
Uh, but she was rather sanguine about the, the ritual enucleation of children. Uh, and it seemed to me terrifyingly detached from the very real suffering of millions of women in Afghanistan at this moment. So this kind of impossible juxtaposition of views uh, is something I'm encountering a lot now uh, among disproportionately well-educated uh, and liberal people. So it's, it's, um, it's something we have to grapple with. Now the issue for most people is that it has been said over and over again that there's a distinction between facts and values and that science and rationality generally can only really make truth claims about the former. So science obviously can deal with facts. We have a universe of facts that we can understand to a greater or lesser degree. Facts transcend culture in some basic sense. But it's thought that values are another thing entirely. Values are, are the domain of questions of right and wrong and good and evil. And inconveniently for us, this is the area where the most important questions in human life arise. These are questions like, you know, how, you, how should you raise your children? What goals should you strive for in life? What, what constitutes a good life? And it's thought that science will never be able to tell us the right answers to these questions. It's just as science is never going to tell you whether you should like chocolate over vanilla, it's not going to tell you how you should raise your children or treat your neighbor. Now, I think this is an illusion. I think this is quite confused. And it's a, it's a dangerous illusion. For as I said, it erodes the conviction of very smart people in the face of really barbaric practices um, which occasion needless human misery. Now, it's, it's long been obvious that we have needed a universal framework to think about values and, and morality. Uh, in, the, in the immediate aftermath of World War II, the UN put forward its, its Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and yet the American Anthropological Association I die here, yeah. in all its wisdom, came forward and said, this is a fool's errand. You can't put forward a universal declaration of human rights because you're merely foisting one provincial notion of value onto the rest of humanity. It's, it, 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 it's an intellectually illegitimate thing to do. Okay, now this notice, this is the best our social sciences could do, really with the crematory of Auschwitz still smoking. This is 1947. Now, I think the connection between facts and values is actually straightforward and philosophically uninteresting. Uh, and I'm going to elide many of the, the common categories and distinctions one finds in, in philosophy and in what's called meta-ethics. Uh, I just want to say that there's going to be a, a Q&A afterwards, and if you think I've missed some crucial bit of philosophy uh, in my treatment here, please come to the mic and... and and deliver the, the devastating argument. I want to hear from you. I don't, I don't want you to l leave with your doubts intact, but I'm convinced that, that many of the categories we have in philosophy to talk about the, the, the truth value of, of morality and the relationship between values and, and facts are, are needlessly confusing, and there's just no reason to keep rehashing these, these uh, ancient and, I think, truly moribund debates. <clears throat> values reduce to facts about the well-being of conscious creatures. The well-being of conscious creatures is what can be valued in this universe. Okay, you, if you doubt this, just imagine a universe populated entirely by rocks. Okay, rocks presumably have no inner dimension. There's nothing that it's like to be a rock. We are, we are right to be unconcerned about the experience of rocks because we think there's, there's no possibility of experience there. And I think we are right to be con more concerned about our fellow primates than we are about insects because we think that there's, there's an inner dimension there that can be modulated to a much greater degree by changes in the universe. In a, a universe... For changes in the universe to matter, they have to matter to some conscious system. Now, 
here's the, if you doubt this, here's the, the one bit of philosophy I'm gonna, gonna anchor this to. This is, it seems to me the only assumption you have to buy. Imagine a universe in which every conscious creature suffers as much as it possibly can for as long as it can. Okay, this, I call this the worst possible misery for everyone. Okay, the worst possible misery for everyone is bad. Okay, if, if, the, if the word bad is to mean anything, surely it applies to the worst possible misery for everyone. Okay, now, if you don't think the worst possible misery for everyone is bad, or you think there might be something worse, or you think it might have a silver lining, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, and I, I'm pretty sure you don't know what you're talking about either. The moment you grant me that the worst possible misery for everyone is bad, okay, and worth, therefore worth avoiding, and if we should do anything in this universe, we should avoid the worst possible misery for everyone, well then, you have the worst possible misery for everyone over here, and you have every other possible constellation of conscious experience, which by definition is better. Okay, so you have this continuum here of possible states of consciousness, and given that consciousness is related to the way the universe is, is constrained by the laws of nature in some way, there are going to be right and wrong ways to move along this continuum. There are going to be ways to think you're avoiding the worst possible misery and to fail. There is, is it going to be possible to have erroneous beliefs about how best to move from your current space on this continuum to something better. Uh, now this is, in, in philosophy, a somewhat controversial statement. Again, I, I, I do not see how. Uh, but it meets with objections of the following sort. You hear people say, well, <clears throat> what if someone wanted to torture all conscious beings to the point of madness? How could you ever prove that he's not as good as you are? Okay. I mean, this is the kind of email I get. Okay. <laughs> or more relevantly, how could, if, if a member of the Taliban is going, wants to throw battery acid in the face of a little girl for the crime of learning to read, how could you ever convince him that he's not as moral as you are? Again, this is really the kind of email I get. Now, this is a, a pseudo-problem. Uh, this is, notice you, we don't confront this. Oh, I failed to anticipate a slide. <clears throat> A religious conception of morality, again, falls into the same concept of well-being and its, and its possible changes, the conscious well-being of creatures. So if, if you are concerned about a lifetime of happiness with God after death in heaven and avoiding a lifetime of misery in hell, again, you are concerned about consciousness and its changes. You just happen to think consciousness and its changes are most importantly experienced after death for eternity. Now again, this is a claim about which science has some rather obvious doubts, but this is still the same framework. We're talking about consciousness and its changes. Now, <clears throat> this challenge, this fundamental skeptical challenge about well-being not being worth valuing, and how could you convince someone who doesn't value it? <clears throat> Notice how this maps on to our notion of, of, of physical health. Okay, physical health is loosely defined. Okay, we, we don't have a clear definition of health. We sort of know it when we see it. It has something to do with not dying too early. It has something to do with not always vomiting. Okay, not being in continuous pain. Now, if we re-engineer our genome so that we can live to be a thousand and regrow missing limbs like a salamander, okay, this, that will become part of our expectation of basic physical health. Uh, so, it, this, so this notion of health is, is truly elastic, and yet the, the fact that it can't be clearly tied down uh, is not a problem for the science of medicine. No, you, don't, you don't hear a philosophical challenge to medicine of the following sort. Who are you to say that not always vomiting is healthy? <laughs> what if you meet someone who, all, who wants to always vomit and wants to be dead tomorrow? 
what you don't you, you don't hear someone say, how would you convince a person with terminal smallpox that he's not as healthy as you are? Okay, this is you, this kind of attack upon medicine would make no sense, and yet this is precisely the the attack one hears from moral relativists and multiculturalists when you talk about the very obvious and needless and horrific misery of millions of people in, in situations that are anchored to really pathological notions of good and evil. Now, even the most basic, apparently value-free descriptions of, of fact in science are also anchored to values in a way that, that would never survive this kind of skeptical challenge you meet uh, when you talk about morality. Consider water. Okay, water is a substance we now dimly understand. For about 150 years, we've known it's two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen. What do we do when someone doubts that proposition? I mean, what, do we, what do we do if someone comes into the room and says, well, that's not how I choose to think about water? You know? what, what, what do we do when someone says, well, I'm actually, I'm a biblical chemist, and ke <laughs> you know, you can get your chemistry from science, but I get my chemistry from the book of Genesis, and whatever squares with Genesis is chemistry for me. Okay, now, again, see the analogy to, to moral truth. <clears throat> the only thing we can do in that case is appeal to scientific values. I mean, you have to value understanding the universe. You have to value evidence. You have to value logical consistency. What, if, no, if, if you don't value these things, the conversation stops. There is no convincing someone who doesn't value evidence that they should value it. What, what evidence are you gonna provide to convince someone that they should value evidence? Okay, what, what logical argument are you going to offer to convince them of the necessity of obeying the rules of logic? Okay, so, so even the most basic scientific statements, I mean, you, you don't get more basic than the chemistry of water, you don't get more value-free than the chemistry of water, are anchored to values at every point. So this, this covers Hume's famous notion of you can't get an ought from an is. You can't get a, a statement of, the, of how we should behave or how the world should be based on, it, on a description of the way it is. You can't get an is without an ought. You can't make the most basic scientific statement without conforming to the norms of, of scientific rationality. So, so science is very much in the values business. It is a myth that there's this division between facts and values in science. Now there's another way to bridge this supposed gap between facts and values. And it's this, when you look more closely at what beliefs are, we form beliefs about the world in many domains. We form beliefs about facts, obviously, and this constitutes science, but it constitutes every truth claim we make about the world, journalism and common sense and your, your personal uh, memories of your past. But we also form beliefs about values. And this includes religion and ethics and, and questions of right and wrong and good and evil. We decided to look at, the, at these operations at the level of the brain. We, we put people in fMRI scanners and gave them statements to read, statements from many different categories, and just looking to see if the, if the difference between judging something true and rejecting another statement as false was sensitive to content. So we, the statements from, from science, statements from religion, statements from ethics, and we found that the brain is essentially doing the same thing independent of content. So on the left, we have all of our categories bin together, and you get this region of, of, of signal in, the, in the, what's called the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. And in the middle, we have mathematics, and on the right, we have ethics. So mathematics and ethics were probably our most different category areas. I mean, mathematics was just equations. You just had true and false equations. Ethics was statements like, it's good to be kind to children versus it's good to torture children. Okay, so very, obviously very value-laden statements. And the difference between accepting a proposition and rejecting it seemed to be importantly similar. Within the tolerance of, a, of an fMRI experiment, those are 
essentially the same maps. So I'm not placing too much emphasis on this, but I would just suggest to you that if the brain thinks it's doing the same thing when it's accepting a proposition about ethics versus rejecting another proposition about ethics, and accepting mathematical statements versus rejecting mathematical statements, then I, th I think we should be very slow to break our, our worldview into separate fundamental categories of values and facts. So I would suggest to you that belief is really our best effort to map reality in our thoughts. And when we seem to succeed in doing this, when our beliefs about the world survive the, the tests that the world throws up at them, well, then we call it knowledge. Then, we, then we, 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 don't, we don't talk about believing things, we talk about knowing things. But still, we're, we're simply talking about linguistic representations of the world. And I think it's clear that there is a, a continuum of facts about which we could form true or false beliefs that relate very directly to human happiness, to the question of how hu human beings, both individually and collectively, can flourish. And there's clearly a continuum where, on the one hand, you, you can live in a failed state where everything that can go wrong does go wrong. Think of a place like Congo at the moment. This is this photos from Somalia in the 80s. But Congo at this moment, I mean, Somalia is also a failed state, but the worst example probably of any place to be at this moment is Congo, where everyone's daily concern essentially is to avoid being raped and killed by drug-addled soldiers. I mean, it, 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 where there's just absolutely no basis for cooperation, to think about the education of children. Uh, things can go disastrously wrong in human communities, but they go wrong for a reason. And, and how we move from a state of, of absolute and needless misery to something much more idyllic, that movement is still constrained, clearly, by the, the dynamics of, of uh, human psychology and social systems and economic incentives and the rule of law. I mean, all of these, we can't just make everything up. I mean, this is not merely culture that explains these movements. And, Clearly, there are many levels at which we could understand how human life can be improved, how human well-being can be maximized. There, there's the level of the genome. I mean, clearly, there, there are genes for positive social emotions that people can have to a greater or lesser degree. Uh, and there's, at the other extreme, the dynamics of, of econ uh, economies and, and political arrangements. But every place in between, we're talking about anything that can possibly influence states of the human brain. We're talking about genetics and neurobiology and psychology and sociology and economics. So I'm not, I'm not talking, when I talk about science giving us an understanding of human values, I'm not narrowly talking about white lab-coated experimentalists scanning brains. I'm talking about any area of human life where we make truth claims honestly, based on honest observation, and clear reasoning about the nature of reality. There's clearly, there are clearly right and wrong ways for human beings to, to seek to thrive. And this, I think, is easy to see. If you just imagine two people living on Earth, we can call them Adam and Eve. If you just think of two people here, it's pretty clear that they have better and worse options. They're, they're better and worse responses to the predicament of simply appearing in this place. Uh, bad option number one, they could smash each other in the face with a large rock. Okay. The, clearly that is a failure to, to discover the most promising sources of collaboration that the human condition offers. Now, how does this change when you add 6.7 billion people to the experiment? I don't think it does. It just gets more complicated. So what I ask you to consider is what I call a moral landscape, where the, the peaks correspond to the heights of, of well-being, and the valleys correspond to the lowest depths of suffering. 
And one thing to, to realize about this analogy is that it's pretty clear that there can be multiple peaks on this landscape. Uh, it's not obviously so, it doesn't have to be so, but I think it's, it's quite plausible that there are many different ways for human beings and human communities to thrive that are dissimilar and therefore uh, Im importantly different. And if you're living one way, you can't live another way. But clearly there are going to be many more ways to not be on a peak. There are going to be many more ways to fail to be as happy and as creative and as intelligent as human communities could be. Now, why wouldn't multiple right answers be a problem? Well, consider the analogy of food. I would never be tempted to argue that there must be one right food to eat. There are clearly many right answers to the question, what is food? But there, there are obvious wrong answers. I mean, the, the, the distinction between food and poison is still scientifically true. And it's true even with all of the, the, the caveats. I mean, some people are allergic to peanuts. They'll die if they eat them. Peanuts are a poison for them, but a food for us. We can understand all of this in the context of chemistry and biology and every, every science related to human health. People also worry that if there's going to be an ethical principle that's true, it has to always be true. And if you find a single exception, well, then there's no such thing as, as moral truth. Well, consider by analogy the game of chess. Okay, the, the principle of not losing your queen in chess is absolutely worth following almost all the time. It is, it is one of the best things you can seek to do. And yet it admits of nearly countless exceptions. There are moments where losing your queen is, is a brilliant thing to do. Now this is, <clears throat> think by analogy, the, the, the principle of not lying. Now not lying, truth telling, is obviously in so many circumstances, a good thing to do. I mean, the, the, telling lies is just almost the, the easiest way to screw up your life. And yet, when the Nazis come knocking on the door and say, asking whether you have Jews in the basement, you know, that might be a time to uh, forget about Kant and, and uh, tell your first lie. <clears throat> now, the fact that, that, that there's a situational exception to the principle of not lying does not mean that there's no such thing as moral truth. This model of a landscape also admits of the possibility of, of what we call spiritual or mystical experience. I think that there's no question that the human mind is capable of having remarkable self-transcending experiences, and many of which can be very hard won, many of which you have to have a talent, perhaps, to, to access. Uh, and certainly training to access. Uh, and many positive social emotions that we all experience can be brought to a much uh, higher register than we bring them. I mean, something like compassion or empathy. I, I used to be in the habit of saying that undoubtedly there's a Tiger Woods of compassion out there. <clears throat> For obvious reasons, that analogy doesn't work so well at the moment. <clears throat> but I think compassion is best thought of as a skill. It's clearly trainable. It's clearly something that, that people have to a greater or lesser degree. Uh, and we, we're beginning to understand the neurology of, of both its, its appearance and its encouragement. Uh, our minds are, to a significant degree, plastic. I mean, you, you sort of become what you pay attention to. Uh, and this is something, a, a maturing science of the human mind really can put us in a position to understand. How many of you recognize this photo? This is a photo of apparently very happy Nazis. You can't quite make it out. This is from a, a, a book that's now called the Auschwitz Album. There was a photo album that was discovered in an attic somewhere of just <clears throat> Nazis having a, a gay old time. Uh, and it took some, some research to figure out who they were and what they were doing. This was, these were people working at Auschwitz during the peak of its productivity as a, a factory of death. And this was a, they were at a kind of a chalet that was, was a, a few kilometers from the death camp. So this is more or less their mood 
as they were listening to accordion music and lying in the sun and eating blueberries under the plume of human ash coming out of the crematory of Auschwitz. Now, there's nothing about my view of the moral landscape or the link I'm drawing between morality and human well-being that insists that I deny the obvious happiness of these people. I, mean, I don't think they're, they're fake smiles that we see there. I think these are, and I don't think these people are psychopaths. I think pro for the most part, these are normally uh, normal people who would go home and, and pet their dogs and cats and they love their children and they would listen to Wagner and shed a tear. Uh, the, the problem with these people was not that they had a radically different conception of morality. They, they have a moral circle that they had radically delimited. They, they had put most of humanity outside the sphere of their moral concern. And that's what we continually run into in the world. Based on some divisive dogmatism, we run into groups of people who just manage to put the better part of humanity or significant groups of humanity outside their, the, the, the theater of their moral concern. Now, I want to talk about Islam for a moment because I think we are wise to be concerned about it. As you know, I'm concerned about religion in general, but I think we're wise to differentiate specific religious beliefs. Uh, <clears throat> and we are, I think, quite encumbered by political correctness and just frank confusion on this front. Uh, one problem is that we have this one word, religion, which names this truly diverse spectrum of, of fascinations and uh, ideological commitments. And re religion is, is a nearly useless term. It's a term like sports. Now, there are sports like badminton and there are sports like, like tie boxing. Okay, and they have almost nothing in common apart from breathing. Uh, there, there are sports that are just synonymous with the risk of physical injury or even death. I mean, there's sports that are just synonymous with violence. Now, if you get injured playing badminton, you're just embarrassed. <laughs> we're, we're facing a problem at this moment. There, there, is, there is, I'm happy to say, a religion of peace in this world, but it's not Islam. To call Islam a religion of peace, as we hear ceaselessly reiterated, is completely delusional. Now, Jainism actually is a religion of peace. Jainism is a, that the core principle of Jainism is nonviolence. Gandhi got his nonviolence from the Jains. The crazier you get as a Jain, the less we have to worry about you. <laughs> it is. This is, I mean, Jain extremists are, are actually, they are, they are paralyzed by their pacifism. Jain extremists just, they, they can't take their eyes off the ground when they walk lest they step on an ant. They filter every sip of water through cheesecloth lest they sw swallow and they're, thereby kill a bug. I mean, needless to say, they're, they're vegetarian. So the problem, uh, notice, the problem is not religious extremism, okay, because extremism is not a problem if your core beliefs are truly nonviolent. The problem isn't fundamentalism, okay, which we often hear this said. These are euphemisms. I mean, the, the only problem with Islamic fundamentalism are the fundamentals of Islam. Now we have Mullah Omar and Osama bin Laden and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. These guys agree about the nature of reality and how to live within it. And the problem is they are giving a very plausible version of the faith. These are, Osama bin Laden is not the Reverend Jim Jones of the Muslim world. It would be wonderful if he were, but the problem is he is giving an, a, a truly straightforward version of Islam and you really have to be an acrobat 
to figure out how he's distorting the faith. Now, if, he were, if these guys were Jains or Buddhists or Amish or Quakers, it would be, it would be patently obvious how they were distorting their religion. I mean, the, the, in fact, their behavior would be unintelligible. Okay? It is not obvious by the light of Islam. And that, this is just a fact we have to speak honestly about. And no one should be speaking more honestly about this and more volubly about this than moderate Muslims. Moderate Muslims have to find some way to grapple with this fact. But to, but to say that Osama bin Laden is David Koresh is just a lie. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's a dangerous lie at this point. Now, I just want to rehearse for you what, what their, these core beliefs are and what they entail. The belief is that Muhammad got the Quran directly from the Archangel Gabriel in his cave in the seventh century. And it is the perfect word, therefore, of the creator of the universe. <clears throat> I apologize for the cartoonish nature of this image of Muhammad, but quality images are difficult to come by at the moment. <laughs> <clears throat> now, the, <clears throat> the consequence is we have the single book, which is imagined to be the best book on any subject ever written, never to be superseded by any human effort at any point in the future. Now this is a problem because this is a profoundly mediocre book. <laughs> okay. it, it, is, it is dangerous to say this. It is suicidal to say this as a Muslim. It is true. And we have to grapple with this fact. And, the, and, and the, the idea that this is the best book ever written on any subject can only be maintained in a kind of fantastical intellectual isolation. Um, and this, this isolation has actually been achieved in the Arab world to an astonishing degree. Some of you probably have heard this fact, but the country of Spain translates more of the world's literature and learning into Spanish every year than the entire Arab world has translated into Arabic since the ninth century. Okay, that, that's scary. It's scary given that this con the contents of this book really offers precious little rationale for living in a sane and pluralistic global civilization. What it does give you a rationale for is ceaselessly worshiping the perfect being who has given you this mediocre book. And this is, this is a photo of, of Muslims in Kashmir worshiping at a shrine believed to contain a single beard hair from the prophet Muhammad. Now, in showing you this image, I don't actually mean to denigrate the the, the positive emotions that can be associated with this kind of practice. I mean, I think devotion is a, is a positive emotion uh, that we want in our lives. Uh, and I certainly don't mean to make light of how difficult life undoubtedly is for Muslims in Kashmir. But it seems to me patently obvious, given the challenges that they face and that we all face in, in creating a world worth living in, these people have something more important to do than worship the beard hair of a man who may well have been a, a schizophrenic. <laughs> and again, when I talk about Islam, one, th I, uh, one thing I, sh I should make perfectly clear and should have made it clear at the top, I'm talking about, I I'm talking about the logical and behavioral consequences of ideas. I'm not talking about people. I'm not talking about all Muslims. Not all Muslims are terrorists, obviously. Not all Muslims support terrorism. Not all Muslims take Islam all that seriously. Uh, I'm certainly not talking about a race of people. I'm not talking about Arabs. I'm not talking about nationalities or ethnicities. I'm talking about ideas and what people can plausibly do on their basis. And what people do on the basis of these ideas it turns out to be very bad for women to, to a remarkable degree and in general. And there really is no basis in Islam to argue that there's, there should be true equality between the sexes. I mean, you, have to finesse, you can finesse this issue, but you, what you cannot get is a, just a clear statement of men and women are equal and have the same moral stature. It's just not true. You, ha you have to edit the faith 
to get that. And one thing you also get by the logic of, of the faith at this moment is this death cult behavior that we're now all too familiar with. Suicide bombing of the most extraordinary uh, and ceaseless kind. I mean, if you can reliably turn to page eight of the New York Times every day and discover that someone has blown up a mosque somewhere. First thing to point out is that no one suffers by this more than Muslims. I mean, they're Muslims getting killed by this. It's not Americans for the most part. Uh, this is a bombing in Pakistan uh, where Sunni bombed a Shia procession. Now the Sunnis view the Shia as apostates and bombing them uh, makes sense. Uh, the core issue here is this notion of martyrdom. The, the notion that death in defense of the faith is the, is the surest way to paradise. Okay, this, this belief is what makes sense of this behavior. Now, this, I want to linger over this image for, for a minute, actually. This is a little girl. You can, can't quite see her in this lighting, but this little girl crouched over the, the corpse of her mother. And this is actually not the initial bombing. What they did is they bombed a procession of Shia pilgrims, and then they sent another suicide bomber to the hospital to wait for the ambulances to come in to blow up the casualties and the doctors and the nurses and the ambulance drivers. So this is a shot from outside the hospital. And just imagine this. I mean, just imagine what it was like for someone to come up with that idea. It's kind of creative in a, in a truly diabolical way. Someone had to volunteer to be the suicide bomber. I mean, someone had to get up in the morning thinking this is the best use of his life to blow up this little girl's mother. And I mean, this is, again, realize this is not collateral damage. This is the point of the exercise. In fact, by, by, the, by this logic, by the logic of this belief, it is impossible to kill the wrong people because all the good Muslims you blow up are going to go to paradise and they're going to thank you. All the, all the bad Muslims, all the apostates and the infidels are going to go to hell where they belong. It is impossible to screw this up. Now, just so you don't get the sense that I'm narrowly focused on Islam, <laughs> I would point out that the moment you see the link between morality and human well-being, you can see that notions of right and wrong and good and evil that, that come to us from, from religion often break this connection. And that's what's so dangerous about religion. I mean, in the best case, religion gives people bad reasons to be good where good reasons are actually available. In the worst case, it just disregards human well-being entirely. So, for instance, the Catholic Church is simply more concerned about stopping contraception than stopping the rape of children. I mean, that is a, a fact about both of the beliefs of this particular person, the use of his energy over the last several decades, and just the energy of the church. If you know anything about the child rape scandal in the Catholic Church, it is mind-boggling the effort that was not spent to protect, protect children and the effort that was spent on sheltering the rapists from, from secular justice. The Catholic Church is also more concerned, incidentally, about stopping gay marriage than stopping genocide. I mean, this is what its attention is on. Okay. This, when you, when you realize that questions of right and wrong actually relate to questions of human well-being, this is, a, this is not morality. This is not an alternate moral framework that we have to take seriously. The Catholic Church could talk about physics. It could say, well, you know, we're actually interested in the physics of the transubstantiation or the physics that allows the Holy Ghost to be here and there and everywhere all at once. But th there's not a physicist alive who would have to take those utterances seriously. Okay, I'm saying that, that have you, if, you, if you talk that way, you don't get invited back to the physics conference. <laughs> what I'm saying is that the moment we admit that morality relates to human and animal well-being, you don't have to get invited back to the morality conference either. Now, I'm going to briefly... Uh, 
time. I'm going to briefly uh, remind you of some of the reasons why religion can't be the repository of our moral wisdom generally. One is that when we, we go to Scripture, we're the guarantors of the wisdom we find there. And we, we find the golden rule, and we say, aha, that, that's why you should read the Bible. Okay, that's just about the wisest thing ever said. But then we, and we includes fundamentalists and Orthodox Jews, we ignore the rest of the book. We ignore the places in, in Deuteronomy and Leviticus and Second Samuel where the, the most mind-numbing theocratic barbarism is recommended. Um, so we bowdlerize the book. So it, clearly our, our moral tools are coming from outside the text. There's also the fact that there's obvious contradictions between the world's faiths. And this is, this is a map of, of world religion. This is an example I've taken from my colleague Richard Dawkins. This is not how knowledge spreads over the face of the earth. I mean, this is, there's no reason, if, if you're in the business of understanding truths of any kind, truths about human well-being, truths about the universe, you wouldn't expect your belief system to hug national boundaries in this way. And no one, I, I think, if you just imagine India. Uh, is it possible that, that they believe, the, the billion Hindus in India at the moment, that they alone, among all the, worth, the world's people, well, they could probably build me a better remote, there's no doubt about that. Uh, <laughs> do, do they even think that they know that Ganesh the elephant-headed God exists and must be worshipped. I mean, this is, this is not the way we're discovering things about the, the nature of the world. The people are accidentally born into the right belief system by dint of geography. Now, apart from the contradictions between faiths, there are impressive patterns of contradiction within every faith. Each one of these red arcs is linking a, two verses in the Bible that are just deal breakers for omniscience. I mean, these are these are statements that. I mean, the, the Bible is just self-refuting in hundreds of places. Jesus was crucified the day before the Passover meal. Jesus was crucified the day after the Passover meal. I mean, you just cannot make sense of of these two claims. There's also the inconvenient fact that the most important and <clears throat> easily resolved moral conundrums are conundrums that the creator of the universe apparently gets wrong. So slavery is perhaps the most consequential and easiest moral problem we've ever had to confront. Slavery is supported in the Bible, both in, in the Old Testament and the New. There's, the, 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 the God of Abraham never envisioned a time where human beings ceased to keep slaves. That is a fact. And then Jefferson Davis, the, the president of the Confederacy, was right to point out that theology was on the side of the slaveholders. I mean, it was despite theology that we got rid of slavery. Now, I want to talk to you for a minute before I wrap up about moral intuition and how it can seem to be confounded uh, because people take its, the, difficulties, the difficulties we have in answering moral problems as a sign that there can be no such thing as moral truth. And I want to argue that that's, it's in, in fact a sign of no such thing. This is the trolley problem, which some of you have probably seen. A trolley is coming down the tracks. If you do nothing, it will hit and kill five people. But you stand at a switch, and you can throw the switch, diverting the trolley onto another track so that it kills only one person. So you would, na you would, set, you would save a, a, a net four lives. Presented this way, something like 95% of people think you absolutely have to throw that switch. You would be a monster not to throw the switch. But the problem is you can present it another way. A trolley's coming down the track now, but you stand on a footbridge, and beside you is a suitably large fellow who you can push into the path of the oncoming trolley, <laughs> killing him, unfortunately, but saving five workmen and a net four lives. Now, when presented this way, everyone's intuition seems to flip and something like 95% of people think you would be a monster to push that man. I think, I, I think this is actually 
somewhat ill-posed because I think we have an intuitive physics and most of us burn a lot of fuel worrying about whether the guy's really going to stop the trolley. <laughs> <laughs> but even if you stipulate that he will stop the trolley, and these are truly identical outcomes, it's still a problem for most people and our intuitions get pushed around. Now that is not a sign that there's no right answer to the trolley problem. Um, I think, in fact, one of, the, one of the details is that they are not equivalent and it's, it may just be different to push someone up close and personal than to throw a switch in terms of the consequences of everyone involved. I mean, in one scenario you could wake up with nightmares for the rest of your life and the other you could, you could think you're a hero and if that's just a difference of human psychology, we have to take that into account in our, in our, in our evaluation of consequences. But consider what we do with our logical intuitions. This is the Monty Hall problem. How many of you have seen the Monty Hall problem? Okay, this is, this is Berkeley, you're just taking coals to Newcastle here. Um, so you're on, you're on a game show and you're given a choice of three doors. Behind one door is a new car, behind the other two are goats. And you pick door number one. If you, if obviously, if you pick the car, you get, you get to keep it. You pick door number one, and Monty Hall then opens door number two, revealing a goat, and he gives you a choice to switch your bet to door number three. And how many of you think you should switch? How many of you think there's no reason to switch? Okay, well, there's, there's a, uh, a powerful intuition that many people, many certainly many naive people share, that there's no reason to switch. Okay, there's just there's two doors. We've got a car behind one, a goat behind the other. Why would you switch? This is a, this is a coin toss. Now it turns out you should switch, and your your chances double if you switch because you you had a one third chance when you picked door number one, and now the two thirds chance has, has fully collapsed onto door number three. But even very smart people, even mathematicians, people who understand probability theory, can just get led back into thinking, wait a minute, there's, there's two doors, there's a car, there's a goat, why do you switch? And now, incidentally, it's easier to see if you, if you imagine being confronted with a thousand doors and you pick door number one and then Monty Hall nullifies 998 doors leaving door 576. Here, it's pretty obvious you've been given a, a ton of information and, and switching makes sense. The point, however, is that the fact that our intuitions get pushed around never leads anyone to say, well, maybe there's no right answer to the Monty Hall problem. Maybe there's no such thing as logical truth. That's not, that's, we're never tempted to do that. There are perceptual illusions that are, are truly reliable. I, I, anyone who's got a clear shot of the screen sees the, the tower on the right leaning further to the right than the tower on the left. And yet, these are the same photograph we can get behind our failures of intuition in science. Our, our, our failures of, of intuition tell us a lot about how we are wired, in this case about how the, the visual system is organized. But there's no question that there are, just as there are perceptual illusions, there are moral illusions. And these are illusion, illusions that we have to find a way to get behind. This is based on re research by Paul Slovic. He asked groups of people, how much would you give to help a a little girl in need. Now when you ask people that question you get a maximum rating of, of empathy and a maximum donation and if you ask a group how much you'd give to help, how much would you give to help a little boy in need, you get the same response, maximum empathy, maximum donation. The problem however is that when you ask them how much they would give to, to a little girl and a little boy in need, you get a 25 percent diminishment in both self-reported empathy and material donation. I mean, our, our concern goes down by a quarter by adding another child. Now this is clearly not a normative result. I mean, this, this is a bug, not a feature. I mean, if, you, if you care about a little girl and you care about a little boy, you should care at least as much about their combined fate. And it, and it gets worse. The more kids you add, the more altruism and empathy diminishes. Now, this is what, <clears throat> this explains what Slovak has called genocide neglect, the f this fact about ourselves that many of us have noticed, that we 
we find genocides boring. I mean, we are, we can't, we do not have the, the attentional and emotional resources to pay attention to the greatest occasions of human misery. And yet we have endless resources to pay attention to the story of one little girl trapped in a well. This is an image that perhaps uh, many of you are too young to recognize, but this is baby Jessica pulled from a well for something like 120 hours. She was in this well, and it was just wall-to-wall -wall television coverage. I mean, everyone with a television was desperate to see how this was going to turn out. And yet, 800,000 people can be hacked to death in Rwanda, and if it even makes the news, we can't barely, we can barely pay attention to it. This is something that we have to, we have to engineer our better selves into our, into our laws and our social institutions so that we can protect ourselves from our moment-to-moment -moment failures of moral intuition. So, to conclude, I would point out that the moment we admit that there are right answers to questions of human well-being and that morality relates to this domain of facts, then we have to admit that certain people care about the wrong things, which is to say that certain people, certain individuals, subcultures, and even whole cultures, perhaps, care about things that reliably produce needless human misery. And it seems to me that the only way we're going to converge on a truly common project and build a global civilization in which we can live toward the same shared values is to admit that this intellectual terrain exists, to admit that morality relates to questions of well-being and well-being relates to how we are at some basic level and how the universe is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I guess I get to be first here. Um, Please. Uh, Sam, in, in many of the speeches, it's sort of the, the same theme. You know, there, there's some quest for some type of universal truth based on science, and then there's also putting down all the other moral systems that really religion has that obviously don't work, you know, completely. Some work to some extent, some work to the other. But did you know that there's already a system written of morality based on science? And if you look it up, you know, you can put yourself like way ahead of the game because it's well, already been done. What is that system? Church of Reality. Church of Reality, okay. Church okay. of Reality. Okay. Look at the website. Okay. Uh, it's something I started about 12 years I, ago. I've heard of the Church of Reality, but. Okay, but you, you got to read the website okay. because it's more than just the name. Sure. It started out as just the name, okay. but then it, it occurred to me like it occurred to you. Well, that I, I'm, I'm uh, inclined to shorten it a bit to just reality. Well, I know that. I know that. I know that. <laughs> and then I, 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 I think I we can talk about it. I, I know people turn off when they hear the word church, but I put the word church in there because I wanted to get the attention of the okay. religious well, world so that I can win souls for Darwin. Well, I, I, I mean, we're, on, we're clearly on the same team, and I, I wish you the best of luck right. with it. Okay, but here, here's the thing about it is that... Um, but the, yes, uh, the, apologies, but there's a, there's a very long line forming yeah, behind you. So I, I understand, but... But you, if, everyone if can go to the you website. Read the site, I have, I have built a complete moral system based on science. Okay. Read okay. the site. Thank you. Thank you. Bertrand Russell said... Uh, Philosophy is basically gorging upon the stew of every conceivable idea. And recently, Peter Hacker had an article that uh, kind of followed that up and uh, dealing with how language kind of confounds a lot of our problems by uh -huh. creating nonsense. Right. Uh, how much of that do you think is, is sort of 
inherent in, in the whole problem with creating a science out of religion and that a lot of people who have objections seem to be basing their objections on things that really are more tricks of language than yeah, actual... Yeah, yeah. It's a huge problem. It's a... Uh, people have associations with words that are um, very difficult to correct for in an elegant way and, and people have... A, for instance, even, and this is... This is a, true in science as well. They're, they're sci I run to scientists who think that the, the difference between subjective and objective is hugely important and that subjectivity in some sense can never be understood scientifically. Um, I mean, this happens more among physicists than... than the qualia problem. Basically. Yeah, yeah. It's just a, how would we ever understand what it's like to be another person? And, and it's just there, there are some very philosophically unsophisticated views even in in among very smart scientists and um, I mean that one is th this th this is a, a crucial distinction that I'll just uh, briefly go into we use use words like subject and objective in two very different ways actually a local uh, giant here John Searle is, 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 the, is the first to make this point at least in my hearing we talk about subjectivity and objectivity ontologically, uh, which is to say in terms of what exists, but we also talk about it epistemologically in terms of how we know things. And so when you, we, ontologically there are just, there are objective facts, third person facts about the physical world, and there are subjective facts, facts about what it's like to be a, a certain conscious creature. And we can talk about both of those honestly and searchingly and in the context of science. The, 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 the epistemological subjective and objective difference is, is, the, is where bias and personal views, and I like chocolate and you like vanilla, and why do you, you know, how should I cut my hair? And I mean, the, all, you know, all of this, those kinds of questions, merely personal, merely subjective, the, 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 the notion of subjectivity that diminishes uh, truth claims, that has nothing to do with uh, studying the nature of, of any conscious system. I mean, that's just, we, we're, so we're using the difference between subjectivity and objectivity in, in very confusing ways, and so people think, well, it's just merely subjective. That's just your opinion. Who can say what, who can say what a good life is? Um, it, doesn't make any, it doesn't make any sense when you talk about uh, physical health, and it shouldn't make any sense when you talk about psychological health or the health of societies. I had two uh, hopefully brief questions. I hope you'll answer at least one. I think the point evangelist Christians might make if they ever read your book, which, which is wishful thinking, I agree, is this. Even if there are theories of morality that do not depend on God, as you clearly demonstrate, they'll say they're not relevant. Why? Because without God to punish them, people will do whatever they like. As Dostoevsky, I'm sure people know, is often quoted as writing, if God is right. not, then all is permitted. So you still need religion, they would say, or at least a history of religion even now in godless Denmark for human beings to behave themselves. So right. how would you respond right. to that? Right. Well, That's question well, one. Well, I, actually, I, I just got to limit you to one because okay. just the line behind That's you is daunting. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's, well, one, it's not true because clearly atheists can be motivated to be good in the same way. And, and, and in fact, the most secular societies on earth, in fact, the most atheistic societies on earth right now are societies in Western Europe that are, are characterized by highly moral behavior by any index but, you would use. But they had a history of religion before. Okay, but they, they've, they've shed their history and they seem to be better for it. So that, oh. that's inconvenient for the, well, the thesis. It but, may be. but Clear, clearly, the, the, there is a challenge here for us to want the right. I mean, there are people who are not capable of wanting what they should want. And there are, there are psychopaths, right? There are people who li have, have brain damage, which we're beginning to understand, and they don't feel empathy for other people. Okay, so there's pe certain people are not up to the, to the, the, the challenge of living a wise and ethical life. And we have to understand that. Now, there are cultures that make, the, there, there are ways of, undoubtedly ways of raising children, ways of talking to one another in the public sphere, and institutional mechanisms to put in place that can encourage the greatest number of people to want to collaborate freely and non-oppressively and creatively with, the, with everyone else. And that's the challenge for us. We have to build a global civilization that allows 
most of the people who want to do that to do that. And there's some obvious principles that are, are so obvious that they basically should be non-negotiable. Uh, things like free speech and the rights of women. You know, those are, those are probably not on the table to be uh, doubted. And yet so many societies don't even have that. The most basic rudiments of, of building a sane uh, sphere for public discourse. And so we just, we have to, uh, the, kind of the first pass of, of what we should do is, is what any sane person would want to do given all the facts. Um, and the trade-offs between individual and the, individuals and the collective or between you know, the free speech versus privacy, all of these things, there, there are difficult ethical dilemmas that we, we can run into at the margins or, or in our lives personally. But the biggest moves for us to make as, as whole cultures are so obvious and so, and, and they're, they're moves that would, that would lift every boat with the same tide. I mean, the, stopping nuclear proliferation, stopping our contribution to climate change, stopping the causes of war, stopping pandemics, all of these things are good for everybody. And um, so it's just, I don't see, you don't need divisive religious dogmatism to help that project along. In fact, it's, it's one of the most obvious things standing in its way, I think. Thank you. Yeah. So the, uh, the proof of concept visual you showed about the moral landscape, mm -hmm. how do you think we can take, how, how do you think scientists, your peers or yourself, could in, get in, inspiration from that and actually come up with, say, a mathematical model or framework that will be ever evolving for sure Something that we can start with so we can get something actionable out of the scientific right. research. I mean, I can't wait for the day where I could go to the BBC News website and be able to see the moral finding of the week uh, yeah, yeah. with the, uh, you know, right. with the landscape uh, visual well, there. I mean, I think it's, you know, in, in detail, it's, it would certainly take a long time. But I think the most important moves, again, don't even require more data. I mean, we know that throwing battery acid in the face of little girls who want to learn to read is not a good thing to do. We don't have to scan anybody's brain to figure out that that's not yeah. really compassion and that's not really good for society. And, and so um, I think we have to just, so the, the core move is to admit that there are right answers to the question of how human beings can live lives worth living. I'm, I'm, just, uh, wish, I'm just appealing to the visual marketability yeah, of yeah, yeah. Well, I think it, it, it does, I mean, it, there are many things that fall out of it. One is just the, the many peaks, as I said, but there are, there are other dynamics of it. There's the fact that we might often have to move downward in order to move upward to a higher place. And I think there, there, there's a, an evolutionary argument, for instance, that altruism could only have formed in communities that were warring with other communities. And so the, the, the actual, our, our core moral tool at the moment of, 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 of caring to collaborate with one another within a group is something that could have only, uh, only been born, if, if Samuel Bowles is right, by first kind of descending into this, this valley of internecine struggle. And now if that's true, then so be it. But clearly that's not our circumstance now. I, I mean, I understand your, your question. I just think we have to, one, admit that human well-being is a, an intelligible subject to be studied scientifically. That, ha that has started to happen in psychology and, and neuroscience. But we then have to admit that, there, that whatever we find there has truly transcultural consequences in the same way that, er that, that, that facts about human health do. Uh, and if culture does make a contribution, which I think it certainly does, if culture changes us in ways that are relevant to, to human well-being, it does that by changing our brains. I mean, still it's realized at the level of the brain, and we can understand that in science. But I mean, it's going to be a long time before we have a lot of detail. I'm just trying to get the project motivated. So. Thanks. Hi, I apologize for the vagueness of the question, <laughs> but I don't stay up at night wondering about, you know, whether 2 plus 2 really equals 4. Right. Uh, but I do stay up at night wondering about how much I should donate to charity and, you know, what it does mean to lead a good life. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you can envision a point at which the certainty that we have about mathematical truth, I is it just a matter of the complexity of the issue, do you think, that, yeah. we, that begets this kind of, you know, uh, difficulty in, in understanding these things? Or is it, 
are there other factors? Yeah, well, yeah, a good question. There are, um, there are a few factors. One is there's the understanding it in terms of science. Clearly, it's a, it's, a, it's a much more complex issue, and one analogy is economics. You know, when is economics going to be a science? Who knows? I mean, clearly, we're in a position to be just surprised by the dynamics of economic systems. And maybe that's always going to be true, but no one would be tempted to say, well, there's just no truth there, you know, or it's a sign of bigotry to criticize somebody's response to a banking crisis. I mean, clearly we're operating in a situation where there, there are truths and we just don't know them, um, and we're worried. And that's, uh, so there, there's an ana analogous uh, issue there with morality. But speaking personally, <laughs> it's nowhere written that it's easy to be good, you know, and, and we have other motives. I mean, we're selfish and we, we want certain things that we know we probably shouldn't want, or which is to say we would, we would be happier and we wouldn't regret it if we could overcome these wants, you know, but yet we still want, we, or we want to lose weight, but we also want a hot fudge sundae. Uh, so we're, we're multiform in our motives. And um, I think the most important move for all of us to make is to, is in our most reflective moments to, under, to, to come up with an honest opinion about what should happen and then to engineer that at the level of society so that if, if our tax code dealt with the problem of how much we should be giving to you know, homelessness, say, we wouldn't be having to recalculate every minute about whether we give or we don't give. I mean, we, we, we have to solve the problem of homelessness to take one problem among uh, uh, myriad there's, there's, there are more and less intelligent ways to address it. We clearly haven't discovered the way that, it, that is actionable, that is really going to work. Uh, but the idea that there's no way to address it seems frankly crazy. And the idea that we're all left with just deciding whether to take a dollar out of our pocket, I mean, that, that's clearly not the remedy. And yet that's the kind of remedy, that's the kind of problem that each of us in the privacy of our own lives worries about in terms of our own ethical responsibility. I think. I think the, the bigger swings are going to happen at the level of what we engineer at the level of society. But it's, it's a hard problem. It's, it's the koan we all have to solve moment to moment. Yeah. Uh, Mark Lewis, OptimalHumanValues.com. Thank you for your work, Sam, oh, in this you. area. I, I see two central challenges to your basic premise or your basic conclusion that science can determine human values. Oh. One is the philosophical case, which I believe you address relatively effectively in your book. The second is, we could say, a fear that if we cede the realm of values to science, right. that science will make a mistake and tell us to value the wrong thing, and in the process destroy things that are truly valuable and important. And the challenge that that poses seems to me from the people I've spoken with about your book has them not want to face the arguments in your book because they're right. afraid that if they listen to the arguments, right, that right. they'll have to see yeah, yeah. that. Question. People have creepy associations with the word science, and they think what I'm advocating is a kind of brave new world scenario where uh, you know, everyone's just going to be medicated with the right drug. Um, so science, science is our truly open conversation in which we are most constrained by honest observation and clear reasoning. I mean, this is it's like it's, it's, where, it's when we get our it's when we make our best effort to get our biases out of the way, and get and, and our wishful thinking out of the way, and just talk honestly about what we know and what we don't know. Um, and the suspicion that that might I mean, it's a very strange intuition that that the most important questions in human life must fall outside of science because what we're saying is that that, that when you become most intellectually honest, when you get your wishful thinking out of the way, when you get your biases out of the way, when you rely upon clear reasoning and honest observation, that's precisely the mood you can't be in to address the most important questions in human life. Okay, that's weird, and and we should we should point that out. Uh, <clears throat> There, there is no other mood to be in to address the most important questions. And, and science is, and so again, I don't define science narrowly. I'm defining, it's, it's evidence-based rational discussion that's, that where people's convictions are going to scale with 
the quality of the arguments and the quality of the evidence. And that is really the antithesis of what happens in religion. Uh, and it's, it's what's brought to really an exquisite refinement in science per se, but it's also true of all intellectual discourse. And so it's just, it's not about getting, you know, science, get, your, your fear is, 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 or the fear you're expressing could be applied to, to medicine. You know, what, we're all afraid that science is going to get human health wrong and disease wrong and cancer wrong. And, well, yeah, it's possible to get these things wrong, but the, the remedy for, for getting them wrong is always just better science. It's, it's better, it's, 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 it's understanding the facts more clearly. And it's, the, the, the antidote is never some other process of irrational, uh, you know, faith-based uh, claims about the nature of reality, so. Yeah. I, I yep. hope you'll lead a forum to that end as well. <clears throat> well, thank you. thank you. Thank you for that vote of confidence. Uh, um, I did want to pre preface this by saying that I am not a Muslim. I'm not any religion at all. Uh -huh. But it bothered me when you were talking about Islam being not a religion of peace. Um, uh -huh. Muhammad was a very peaceful man. No, he wasn't. Yes, well, he no. yes. No. and he had a great respect no. for women. Okay. His okay, wives we were... Um, given a great deal of power over him. And Have you been reading right Karen Armstrong? Is that where, where this no, is coming from? Not, no, I've read no. Karen Armstrong, yeah. but no. Um, and, you know, what's happening now with Islam is it's bastardized, just like all the other religions. But right. um, it bothers me that you So you're saying kind the, of true, the true Islam, if we could only return to it, would just nullify all of my concerns about Islam? I don't think any religion is a good religion, but it bothers me that you that you singled Islam out okay. and that and that um, you said that you know that actually that Mohammed was a peaceful man. Okay. And well, that he, he, I mean, Mohammed, whoever I mean, who knows who Mohammed was. I mean, Mohammed's actually closer to history than Jesus and many of the other patriarchs, so we know more about him. Um, but obviously, there's there's a lot of uh, uncertainty about what's factual, but the, the, the example of Muhammad as held in, in Islam universally is not of a pacifist. He's not, he was a conquering warlord who spread the faith with the sword quite successfully. And the expectation is this is a, this is a way of being in the world that is, is by example, totally justified. Uh, now, it's, this is different from Jesus. Jesus, not, he did not spread the faith, the faith with a sword. He was a, essentially a hippie who got crucified. <laughs> now, that's a di different example. And, and, and it's a difference that, that is uh, a benefit to Christianity at the moment because Christianity, in, in Christianity, you can come up with a rationale for saying, listen, it's not about conquering the world. It's not about winning in this life. We just got to wait for Jesus to come back and, and get raptured. Um, <clears throat> But you can't, you can't really do that in Islam. I mean, Christianity has a line like, render unto God that which is God, and unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. And that line has done, from Matthew, has done huge work to, to separate Christianity from, from claim upon terrestrial power. Now, it's, it's, it's imperfect work, and there are a lot of crazy Christians who want terrestrial power, but at least there's some rationale within Christianity for doing that. That rationale doesn't exist in Islam. There is no line in the Quran which says, listen, guys, this is not about politics. It's not about controlling people's lives. You can be well, privately religious and let everyone else flourish. But the subjugation of women was not something that Muhammad no, was you're, interested you're just, in. You're just not. Uh, please just go read the Quran and read, read some significant. Okay, well, then, then surely you read the part in the Quran which talked about husbands scourging or whipping, depending on the translation, their wives who are disobedient. Now, That's in Judaism also. What was that? Okay, but, but okay, so it's in Judaism, but I will grant you that the worst books ever written were in the, the Old Testament, okay? <laughs> but there's a reason why Jews are not stoning their wives for adultery at this moment in history, and we can, we can talk about those reasons. What I said about Islam was intended to counter exactly the presuppositions you are, you are now bringing to me 
I can only, I, I don't have time to do it here, but I can only invite you to read more on the subject because we are, uh, we are deluding ourselves with uh, a lot of wishful thinking. I mean, I, we are desperate to believe that all of the problems in the world are of our own making. If we could just spread more money around and behave better on the global stage, people will, will treat us well. Uh, and that everyone wants the same thing, and it's all a matter of just more education, and, and this religion is intrinsically benign. It's just not true. And, and Osama bin Laden, the, the crucial, I've said this, but I, I should think I should say it again. The real problem is that Osama bin Laden is giving a very plausible version of the faith. Now, you can, you can split a few hairs and say, well, listen, apostates shouldn't be killed unless they speak kind of endlessly against the faith. But... The, the, the penalty for apostasy is death under Islam. And there's no school of Islam which says, oh, no, no, we don't mind apostates. It just doesn't exist. There's no, there's no, there's no reformed Judaism version of Islam. Um, that's a huge problem. It's a, it's a problem that has to be solved by Muslims. That, that, we, that We can't help them solve it by just lying to ourselves about the nature of their religion. I'm sorry. Thank you. Sure. You good to keep going? Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't... Um, maybe uh, there's no way we'll get to the back of the line, so I'm going to let you decide. Uh, but I'm long-winded, and I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I'll try to be short-winded. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for your books. Uh, it made a huge impact on me. Um, and that your breaking down of taboos is, has been phenomenal. Um, in this book, which I enjoyed very much, um, one thought kept nagging at me, and I just want some clarification. Sure. Um, when I think of this moral landscape, and your visual is in my mind, um, it seems to assume, or I think it doesn't assume, but, but intuitively it assumes like that the elevation starts the same, right? And, it, and the question that you just brought up, actually, of resources, some people think you can just spread money around, kept coming to mind. And, and I thought of, I'm sure you encountered Robert Sapolsky at Stanford. Yeah, yeah. And his work with looking at the same species of monkey, you know, we are ourselves biped primates, right? right. You think of, I thought of this example that he has of these monkeys that in an arid, barren environment take risks more, are more aggressive, have a different social yeah, network. Oh yeah, yeah. And then in a more rich, and resource-rich environment are more forgiving and, and uh, equ equitable and so on. And I kept thinking, um, I'm with you so much on this project. Uh, but when I get to the prescriptive part, um, we, I think, can say, we can break down the fact-value distinction and say very clearly, we don't like people doing X, Y, and Z, either in a subculture domestically or uh, internationally, you right. know, Taliban or anywhere else. And however, are there situations in that moral landscape, landscape where some community will have organized its I'm sorry? I, just continue. Yeah. Well, or, organized itself in some kind of um, an optimal or suboptimal, but somewhat right. utility maximizing way, but it's abhorrent to us. And how do we yeah. deal with that? Resource question. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, good question. I, I think there are, well, there are clearly islands of sort of pathological happiness. I mean, I, the, the example from Auschwitz was one. You get the, you get the, the, the guards of Auschwitz all together agreeing that they're, they're loving life, clearly that can't be a peak on the moral landscape because all of that well-being, uh, uh, such as it is, is predicated on just an immensity of, of suffering occasioned outside that circle. And um, I think there are some obvious kinds of, of happiness that people like that are not experiencing. I mean, they're not, I mean, there's, there's insofar as compassion and a, and a connection to, to other people is a source of well-being. Uh, and I think there are probably frontiers for all of us to discover there, just how happy and connected it's, it's possible to be uh, 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 in the midst of others. There's, there's, it's, it's clearly not a peak. So, so we, we can grant that there's sort of weird areas where people based on isolation and based on what they've established culturally. It's, you, you could get an island of, of perfectly matched sadists and masochists, say, you know, where it's just you know, some people just like to be beaten on and some people just like to mistreat them and they're just perfectly matched and pretty happy, you know. But um, 
clearly it's not a peak, and clearly that kind of valuation of experience isn't really well packaged for export. Uh, and I think it's, it's, not, it's not an accident that the... I think we can converge, just as we converge on logical understanding uh, of, of uh, basic facts and in a scientific understanding of, of the world, we don't converge perfectly. I mean, obviously, there's, it's not even a, in, in, in certain situations, it's not even a majority of people who converge. 25% of Americans think evolution is a fact. The rest apparently don't. But biology can still thrive in that context. And I think it's possible that there are moral truths that even a majority may not be up to realizing, but they may still be true, just as they're medical truths that are a majority may not be up to understanding, but they're, they're true. And we have to find some way of empower, just as we want to empower the biologists to talk about real biology, even though they would get voted out of office if, if their neighbors could, we have to empower the people who really understand the danger of nuclear proliferation, say, um, and know that it's worthy of our attention and gay marriage isn't, um, <clears throat> to, to prioritize those things at the level of, of um, you know, public policy. And, um, but it's a, yeah, I, mean, I think there are probably weird places uh, and weird, weird things to pass through in order to, to advance. But, um, yeah, I just, I mean, what, what's the alternative? I mean, all we have is human conversation where we're trying to, to influence one another uh, to share a common project of peaceful you know, cooperation. I guess it would, uh, we should refrain from some of the harsh judgment recognizing that in situations of lack of resources... Well, yeah, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, I didn't deal with that piece. C really clearly, clearly, re clearly material resources are a huge variable in... I mean, it's, it's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I mean, if you're starving you really don't have the free attention to worry about whether stealing is right and wrong, whether you, know, you should value other people's children as, mu as much as your children, or how, what, 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 how much should you discount their hunger over, over your children's. I mean, th you, can't, you can't think about human happiness when you're starving. And, and so we need, and you can't think about human happiness when you're being chased by somebody wielding a machete. Um, you're just reacting. And so we, we need to create the most basic conditions of stability in any society where people then have the free attention to worry about things like education and creativity and, and how they should act so as to maximize uh, their well-being in, in society. Thank you. Yeah. Let's do two more quick questions because sure. we want you to stay and sign books after this. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is the uh, Brave New World question. Okay. Um, if, if, moral, if I understand your premise that uh -huh. morality is based on the experience of human happiness or the experience of the reduction of suffering, then how do you distinguish a drug-induced uh, okay. experience good, of happiness from question. a reality-based yeah. one? Um, well, I think we, we want our subjective states of well-being to be coupled to reality for very obvious reasons, because if, if they're not coupled to reality, then they're vulnerable to the next insult from reality. So why not just take heroin all day long? It's a very pleasant state to be in. You could just keep doing it. Well, the problem is you can't just keep doing it, and you can't value, you can't, you can't attend to all the other things you value in life that are your sources of happiness, like your relationships, like having a career, like not, not dying. I mean, you're, you're, you, you, it's not a stable source of of well-being and um, most of what we care about in life, like, our, like lo loving other people and, and experiencing love in return, is predicated on our, our states of consciousness actually tracking the reality of our lives. Not perfectly, perhaps, but to a significant degree. You can't have real relationships if you're delusional. Uh, and so, or if you're, if you're stoned all the time. I mean, there's, there's a... Um, and this is something we actually will face. I mean, we will, we will get drugs that can really, for instance, take away grief. I think at some point in the lifetime of someone in this room, there will be an antidote to sadness. So that when you're, you know, your wife dies and you're inconsolable, there will be a pill you can take that will take a, that feeling away. Now the question is, when do you want to take it? you want to take it 15 minutes after she dies? You, you want to take it a month after? You want to take it a year after? You want to take it before she dies so that you'll be indifferent to her dying? <laughs> 
uh, I mean, these, these are these, these are real these are real ethical problems. But uh, that movie, The Matrix, you know, kind yeah. of kind of created a scenario where the people who were living in this if if we drug could, induced world it was complete. They didn't need reality to uh, okay, but that's their... that's not that's not our situation in any foreseeable future. I mean, if, if Ray Kurzweil is right. If the singularity is true, and Ray Kurzweil is right, and we're just going to upload ourselves onto the internet in, in 30 years or whatever it is, well, then that's, that's a real challenge. The question is, what, what connection to reality do we want if we can really sort of disappear into this dreamscape of where, where our happiness can be perfectly maintained? That's my moral intuitions get a little shaky there, but we're, in some sense, we're in a bit of a dreamscape already. I mean, we are, all of this is being run on our brains, and we are, uh, we have to creatively respond to the opportunity to, to experience happiness and avoid suffering in this so space. A second logical I'm premise, which is experience of I, I, I'm saying, well, the answer to your question is, in, in our context, we want to be truth tracking to a significant degree for obvious reasons, because what, the moment we're not, we, su we begin to suffer mightily. Uh, and and that's if that ever ceases to be true, well then we can have a conversation about what you know what reality we want to live in. But at the moment we, we're living in this one, and we you know we we have to understand uh, how we're entangled with it, or we will suffer. Thank well, you. Right. Please stay seated in your seats for one last question. I kind of feel like the chosen one here. Right. Um, I want to ask a question because I'm trying to understand if you're claiming that there is one moral truth for a given action or if there could be multiple opposing ones uh, because I can imagine right. some sort of moral dilemma that can have a positive well-being effect on one person right. while at the same time having a negative well-being effect on the other. That's true. And, you know, I'm trying to understand if you're claiming that there is only one. Can there be multiple? Can they be opposing? Is it not absolute? Because I'm, tr no, I'm no. sort of yeah. getting the it's impression that, that you're saying it's absolute. So. Well, no, I, what I'm saying is that there, for that case, there are clearly zero-sum moments where there's, you know, there's one slice of pie left and only one person is going to get it. And... And if, if person A gets it, person B doesn't, and vice versa. Um, I think there are probably right solutions. If we, if we could understand human well-being in a truly fine-grained way, there are probably right solutions to most of those. I mean, e either it doesn't matter who gets it in the scheme of things, or it would be a little bit better if one person got it, or it would be a much better if one person got it. So when, when it really matters, I think that the course, the, the trade-offs begin to to get obvious, but even there, there are there are uh, there are situations in which some people really want something, and some people really want its antithesis, and there's going to be some obvious suffering either way you play it. Now, I'm, I'm thinking of like a, a, a euthanization sort of situation, right, where you have a lifetime of pain worth versus just ending, you know, someone's life. I, I mean, never right. mind even the effects on other family members and yeah. things. But you, you've got those two things. You know, how does science tell us, you know, based on your claim, which one of those we should value more? Well, I, th or I think less bad. I uh, yeah. suppose I should say. Um, well, again, it would be science narrowly described as a comp as a mature science of, of the human mind. Well, then it would have a lot to say. But I mean, we will be able to just will know how much people suffer. You know, the person suffering will will be able to will, will say. I'm suffering this much, and we'll have our suffering detector, which says, yeah, they are suffering that much, and, and boy, does that suck. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, but short of that, all we can do is talk honestly about the trade-offs here. But, but what I'm really trying to fight for is the trade-offs are in terms of human well-being. Uh, they're not in terms of something else. So if you're going to advance a moral argument, you have to at least talk that talk, otherwise it's not a moral argument. So if you're going to oppose gay marriage, say, and say there's all these trade-offs and who knows what uh, is, is true, at least your side of the argument has to be, here is all the suffering that gay marriage is going to cause. Okay, this, this is what's going to happen to children if they get adopted by gay people. This is what's going to happen to... 
there's no burden on anyone to make that argument at the moment because we, we're, we're living in a world where the president of the United States can say, my faith tells me that marriage is between a man and a woman. End of argument. Okay, that, that's, the, that's the move that should no longer be open to smart people and certainly people with responsibility in our society. Thank you. I'm sorry, we have to stop now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.